Okay, today's video is covering the basics of euphonium and tuba. You may be asking yourself why we're covering both of those at the same time. Um, really is because I think it's really healthy to think of euphonium as a soprano tuba because that's really what it is. Um, we can get a lot, I suppose I should touch, touch on this too, we can get a lot into the vernacular of the whole thing. Some people refer to euphonium, some people refer to baritones, baritone horns. There's sort of terminology used um, uh, back and forth uh, pretty easily in that and people know what you're talking about. Um, some manufacturers designate baritones and euphoniums as different. In my understanding of it, and this might not be 100% correct, a euphonium, which I have here, is basically, it is a reduced tuba. This is a king euphonium, and if I took it and sat it next to um, a king tuba of virtually the same model, it would just look like exactly half the size of that tuba and that. So think of it again as a soprano tuba. A baritone, which might be designed somewhat a little bit different, is actually more from the British brass band tradition as being the baritone voice of the bugles, if you will. So it's a baritone horn. And it can be a little bit different in terms of bore and design and that, but for our usage within a band setting, again, you can think of them as interchangeably. Okay? Some things on euphonium. Uh, euphoniums use the same size mouthpiece as a trombone. So everything we talked about in terms of embouchure and such on trombone apply on euphonium. Okay, they apply on euphonium. You will notice this euphonium has four vowels. And they have four vowels, what are, what's referred to often as on top. So we have valve one, two, three, and then four, which has to be controlled once it moves with my pinky. That is not the best design in the world but this is probably the cheapest way to design a horn. Why do we need this fourth valve? Again, because of the whole um, cumulative pitch error idea, CPA, the compensation that we have to make, because our one and three fingerings, uh, our one and three fingering is very, very sharp. Our one, two and three fingering is very, very sharp. So instead of one and three, we use fourth alone. Instead of one, two and three, we use two and four alone, okay? Um, so that's that. You'll also notice, many of you, that some euphonium models have the fourth valve on the side over here, and then it's played with the index finger on the left hand. That is actually the preferable design, because obviously your index finger has uh, much more uh, freedom of movement and strength than your uh, right pinky does, um, but those models do tend to be more expensive. Um, one other thing, going to just touch on it too, is we have two kinds of euphoniums generally. We have non-compensating euphoniums, which this is one of, and you can pretty much tell those because if you find a euphonium brand new that's for sale that's less than $5,000, you can guarantee it's probably a non-compensating one, or a compensating euphonium. A compensating euphonium is one that is of a professional line and what it does it solves the intonation problems in a completely different way in that it it actually mechanically it's like two horns in one in a way and it compensates for tries to compensate for almost all intonation problems on the entire horn whereas on the non-compensating one the fourth valve really is just like the F attachment on a trombone Okay, so that's all you really need to know is if you have compensating euphoniums, that's great. Okay, use them, enjoy them, everything like that. But also realize those were very, very expensive horns for the inventory to buy. This particular horn is my favorite student line horn. This is a King 2280. It's also made under a Bach nameplate. I don't know what the number for that is. But what I like about this horn is a couple of things. One is on the third valve slide down here, and yes, it does have a third valve slide. It has, you can barely see that, I think, right here. It has a spring mechanism. So when we do lower the third valve, and when we use the fourth valve in conjunction with third valve as an F attachment, this will actually allow you to play some of those lower notes with the possibility of being in tune. It comes back on its own with that spring. But more importantly than that is in today's modern concert band, our concept, we talked about this on trombone too, but I think this is even more prominent on euphonium. Our concept of euphonium baritone sound is as to get a dark a sound as possible. And with that, this horn is, I don't think you can really tell here, 
is a large bore horn. It is the same bore as a professional trombone. And most professional euphoniums are going to be larger bore. The ones that most of you saw in middle school for sure and high school possibly that look just like this that were probably silver and Yamaha are not large bore horns. And just like on trombone, it does make a big difference in the tonal concept of having the large bore horn versus. So for the same price as the Yamaha, this King, you get a large bore and I think you get a better built horn overall and uh, the potential for getting much better sounds out of those th these instruments than um, with the uh, traditional small bore four valve horns. But if you've got the small bore ones, then you've got the small bore ones. This would be a nice step up that wouldn't be drastically expensive. Um, you know, this horn probably list price for about $2,800. Um, whereas that professional compensating system, Yamaha horn, probably list price somewhere between, my guess now, $7,000 and $8,000. So needless to say, this is a pretty good value overall. Assembly of the mouthpiece, everything same. Sound production, the same. Holding the instrument, we need to address that. Again, we cradle a euphonium. I'm going to back away from the uh, camera here a little bit. We want to bring our left hand under the belly of this and because I'm taller I cannot let the euphonium set in my lap. I'm going to go ahead and put the mouthpiece in to get the full effect. So we want to set correctly and then bring the euphonium to our face so we're still setting correctly. Well that doesn't allow me to put the euphonium on my lap. It can't set. If I put the euphonium on my lap there's where it is. Even in here in university band you can go downstairs and look at people you'll see great big tall guys and maybe girls playing euphonium that immediately shrink down like this to play because nobody ever told them as they grew you can't keep that thing on your lap anymore you have to bring it up now one thing you can do with some kids as they move up is teach them to have a pillow on their lap they can store the pillow in the bell of the horn or whatever and uh, that can help to give them a little bit more balance especially if they're kind of slight um, that might help but it does need to be cradled up it needs to be cradled up here and with most of your little kids, it will set in the lap. It will set in between their legs and that. But as they grow, you can see where that mouthpiece hits me. You have got to teach them to bring it up. And that's the most easily accomplished by bringing it against the body and cradling it. The right hand, it depends on the design of the valves, which can be different. Notice my four fingers on the valves, that flat C concept. But I want to show you my thumb. There's a brace here, I can keep my thumb underneath, and then when I push a valve down, that gives me some leverage so I can push. Whereas if that thumb's in midair, I have to work a lot harder. So take advantage of the fact that that bar is there. Okay. Um, other things with euphonium, let me think. I think in terms of basics, that's really just about it, and we'll go on to some things that will, uh, since so much of it is like trombone in terms of sound production, we don't need to go into any of that because we've done that on trombone and you guys have all played trombone. Okay, Tuba. And I don't have a tuba up here because I couldn't probably get it in the picture anyway and I was too lazy to drag one up, which is bad, but I'm going to admit it. It's the truth. Tubas, from my money, tubas come in full size, tubas come in three quarter size. And since we've been talking specifically about beginners here, I want to start by talking about three-quarter size tubas. I am not a fan of young kids, no matter how small they are, playing three-quarter size tubas. Um, I think any student, any size virtually can play a full-size tuba. And the biggest reason is, is they have to learn to deal with the it's not really it is resistance but it's the it's the degree of resistance that the tuba has and that three-quarter size tuba can really mess with their approach to the larger tuba later um, in a pinch if you've got three-quarter size tubas you know maybe use them as home practice instruments and that they store a little bit easier than a full-size tuba but they just don't sound very good to be really honest um, uh, the three-quarter size tubas and uh, you're going to have to make that transition anyway. And in judging contests around the state and stuff, middle school contests, I have seen the most petite, short girls carrying full-size tubas on the stage and not having any problem with it. 
One thing that really helps with tubus, somewhat like euphonium, is something to rest it on, a base. What you'll notice all the tubas around here have in Dr. Wass's studio is they will buy a cheap or maybe an expensive drum throne. You can buy a, a drum throne, the throne a drummer, a set drummer sets on to play trap set. You can buy a cheap, you can find one for around $30. And what they do is then they just modify the seat, sometimes making it smaller, maybe maybe making cutting a piece of wood and covering it with padding or whatever so it's, it doesn't take up as much space. And then you can change the height of that drum throne and they set the bottom of the tuba on that throne. And then the horn is just, all you're doing with the horn is balancing it, you're not holding it, and you can bring your body up to it. And that's ideal. And even a, a very small petite, a 90 pound, four foot five girl can play a full size tuba with the right sort of uh, mount to put it on like a drum throne or something. So um, it's just something else. It would be something at your school that you could have a set of. Um, you could have kids get their own, whatever you'd need to do in that. Um, tuba is different. I used to always have a set of school rehearsal tubas. Um, so, the, you know, like I say, the, the most that was, were in a class was four. We would have four tubas and they would stay just in the back of the room uh, securely and every tuba player would use the same horns all day long. Beginners, advanced, whatever. They would have their own mouthpiece. They would share the same stand they used it on. Each one of those kids, though, also had a horn at home because bus drivers don't like tubas. They don't like euphoniums or trombones much either, but they really don't like tubas in terms of the amount of time. And if you want to get a kid to quit band real quick, have them carry a tuba case back and forth every day. They're just incredibly awkward. Um, and you do need a case or the horn gets all dinged up and everything. So school set, home set. And so that's something you have to think about is how many tubas would you have to purchase to have that or have in your inventory. Good thing is you can send a horn home with the kids that isn't, you know, state of the art. It can be just a, an older horn that is in playing condition, but not much more than that. Also on tubas, the euphonium I showed you has piston valves. Many, many tubas have rotor valves like French horns, though they're mechanical, not string. I don't think you'll find a tuba with rotor valves that has string. The valves are so big and the weight so intense that you'll be breaking strings all the time. Their mechanical linkage is what it's referred to as. Some people prefer the rotor valves, some people prefer the piston valves. The rotor valves overall are take less maintenance in terms of regular oiling and stuff. However, when you drop one or bump one and it gets knocked out of alignment, it's a much more expensive and complicated repair. The piston valves require, just like a trumpet or whatever, and because they're so big, um, it's a little bit more cumbersome. They require pretty regular oiling and cleaning and such like that. Um, a lot of uh, around here, uh, the tuba students seem to like piston valves better. Some people think they're quieter and remain quieter over the life of the horn. All rotary valve instruments, after they're played, the rotors loosen up and they become kind of clanky and so forth. So you need to watch that. Um, another thing to remember too is um, that fourth valve. Um, a tuba without a fourth valve to me is not a performance instrument. Uh, you've got to have that fourth valve on there. Um, I guess for a practice horn, three valves would be okay if you had to, but you know, make sure the kid's using their fourth valve. Insist, just as much as you insist your trumpet and cornet players use their kick slides to compensate for the pitch discrepancy with one and three and one, two and three, You've got to specify and demand that your tuba and euphonium players use fourth valve four, one, and three, and two and four combination for one, two, and three. It's not an option. They have to use it, and all four valves need to be in good sync. Um, you will notice a lot of times tuba players that are of a higher level moving slides around for different notes and things like that. Don't be too concerned with that. That's nothing that you're going to be dealing with until a child is old enough and sophisticated enough to be working with moderately sophisticated literature that they're going to be working on tuning things to that degree or whatever. Or maybe you discover something in a, in a uh, piece for that they have to make a pitch adjustment for something. I can remember one time with the horns we had, um, we were playing Carmina Burana with my junior high band, and uh, it opens with uh, the second movement, I believe it's the second movement opens with a, the tubas have a drone of a D just for forever. And the one and two fingering uh, just wasn't, it was always a little bit sharp on all the horns, 
and that. And so we worked with them on their, they pull their first valve slide when they got to that section, about an inch each one of them or whatever for that particular player had to do to be able to hold that long D. It was too long to make an adjustment with the embouchure and be consistent. So we just had them make an adjustment. And then as soon as they were done with that part, they'd pop that slide back down in and that. So that's just some of the things you have to do more often than not. And of course intonation on tuba is really important because that is going to be the lowest sounding voice in your ensemble. And uh, based on where the lowest sounding voice is, everything else has to line up with that. So if your tubas don't play well in tune, if your tuba players aren't taught to be specific about pitch and correct fingerings and such and correct adjustments, you're going to have a hell of a time trying to get the rest of that ensemble playing with them to match up in any kind of a vertical uh, tonal structure. Uh, speaking of tuba uh, themselves, probably the warhorse standard tuba for public school use is a Miraphone tuba. It's a German made instrument. They last forever if they're taken care of. There are Miraphones still being played at in schools that I would bet are 40, 50 years old that are still functioning quite well. Valves might be kind of rattly, but they still function well. The Yamaha tubas are like all Yamaha instruments. They're copies of the Miraphone instrument tuba and uh, they're okay. The difference there though is because it's Japanese, it's an or from the Orient a horn, um, the metal's rolled thinner and so they dent easier and such. So um, you've got to watch that. Um, of the U.S. horns, probably the most popular one are the King models. Uh, it's the tuba version of the King Euphonium I showed you and that. In terms of mouthpieces, didn't talk about this on Euphonium, same as trombone, standard mouthpiece on the Euphonium is a Bach 6.5 AL or its equivalency in another brand. Standard tuba mouthpiece would be a standard tuba Helleberg, Con Helleberg mouthpiece. Um, for a long time people used, a, a lot of people used a Bach 24 AW that has really fallen out of favor in terms of producing a resonant tone through all registers and stuff. Some people feel you really have to fight that a lot, so that's fallen out of favor. And uh, you've seen going more to the Helleberg standard. There are different sizes of Helleberg. The standard is the most common, so make sure you are getting having them get the standard. Again, that's an expensive mouthpiece. Tuba mouthpieces are expensive in themselves, but your tuba player is not going to initially, anyway, be buying a tuba. So their investment in band, participating in band, is that mouthpiece. So require them to have the mouthpiece you want. Require them to have a, a pouch for that mouthpiece so when they're transporting it from school and home and so forth that it doesn't get dinged up. And inspect those tuba mouthpieces every so often to make sure, as well as all brass mouthpieces, but tuba mouthpieces get, seem to get dinged up more than any others, that the um, receptor end right here is completely circle and you can straighten those out yourself um, with a, the, the, the flanging tool that you can buy, you probably should have in your school repair kit. I'll try to remember to show you one of those in class. One of the thing talking about tuba is, what we're talking tuba, is sousaphone. Um, first off, unless you really know what you're doing, do not go into marching tubas or marching basses. Um, ask any of your friends that have marched drum corps how physically demanding that is to hold those instruments. It's incredible. You will have everybody quitting and crying and everything else under the sun. Sousaphones are very ergonomical. Though they're a little tubby and stuff and you can't do the most advanced, maybe, um, general effect moves on the field that uh, you maybe can with a smaller horn. Um, they are fine instruments. Um, the King sousaphones, Con sousaphones, the Jupiter actually makes a four valve sousaphone, though I have heard from a number of people that while it's nice to have the fourth valve, they are, it does uh, contribute additional weight to the horn. And so for public school use, that maybe isn't the best thing in the world. What I did want to talk about in terms of sousaphones, though, is with the neck. The neck should be there, obviously, and then coming out of the neck are two different pieces of metal that are referred to as bits. And they are different than each other because one fits into the other and then that fits into the neck. They are paired. They are expensive too, you need to know that. A pair of bits for a silver sousaphone list price at around $80. And invariably, sousaphone player, players lose their bits. A sousaphone is designed to have a chance of playing in tune with using the neck and two bits. If you only have one bit, 
you have shortened the length of the sousaphone by approximately an inch and a half. That is not a good thing. That means you're knocking that instrument really, really sharp, and you're throwing off the ratios between the lead pipe or the mouthpiece and the valves all to heck. So they have to have two bits. Also, you will have issues with bits getting stuck on mouthpieces. Um, remind me again in class, I will go over and show you the one mouthpiece remover short of going to the repair shop that you can get that will pop those off of mouthpieces. I have one in my closet here. I'll show you that too. I believe that's it. Um, look over the notes. You'll notice on Euphonium and Tuba I gave you some extensive packets on um, uh, other things to do from some really great clinics that I found online. Uh, there's a wealth of resources like on every other instrument too on Tuba and Euphonium to address uh, further advanced needs and so forth, but I think in my mind this is pretty much the basics you need right now. Thank you very much. I spoke too soon. I neglected to do one thing with tuba, and that is to talk about embouchure and tone production. So I grabbed a tuba mouthpiece, and we'll talk about that now. Um, this is, sounds crazy, but I think with 11-year-olds it actually works. If you think of a tuba embouchure as a cross between a horse and a fish, I know that sounds crazy, but if you think of the thickness and protrusion of horse lips, and then if you think of the kind of f fish face, if you will, and obviously it's a very, very open aperture, and the lips are going to vibrate very, very slowly. Most of the issues you'll have initially with tuba players making initial sounds, is, especially if they're in a mixed brass class. <laughs> they will make trombone sounds. They will be playing up an octave from where they need to be. Whereas they need to be buzzing. Down in there. And that's really, as you could tell from me doing it, that's really, really hard to do because when you try to buzz that low, there's very, very little resistance. But that's what you want to do. So initial sounds on tuba are almost always best made on the entire horn rather than the mouthpiece by itself. Um, this is one of Dr. Wass's tricks too that I think really makes sense. If you cup your hand and if you think of the size of a trumpet mouthpiece blowing a trumpet sized airstream in terms of the mouthpiece so you're only hitting like maybe one section of your knuckle right there. Then if you think of trombone being an octave down it needs to be twice that width. So now you're like two knuckles wide. Then tuba, because it's an octave lower yet, you have to be twice that. So it's really what a tuba player is doing as you hold your palm up is you think of filling your entire palm with air. And that's the airstream, the variety of an airstream you need to play tuba. It's, it's almost that Darth Vader kind of voice, which you could tell from that. And it's that whole idea of filling up the entire inside of our hand with air. Now, what are the kids going to notice? That, oh my God, I run out of air like in two seconds. And everybody does. That's just it. That's why it's easier to start on the instrument itself because with the added resistance, and the resistance on a tuba is very, very slight, probably the least resistant of any brass instrument, with that added little bit of resistance, their air will last longer. But they're still going to have to be really masters of expansion of air, their air capacity, and then dealing with the air as they move on. But you do want to get them playing low and warm sounds right from the very beginning. And of course, compared to trumpet especially, the, with the resistance, those of you playing trumpet right now should totally understand that. It is the antithesis of it in terms of the way the air is passing out from the aperture into the mouthpiece. Now we're done. Thank you.